Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. This is a message I spoke as a guest speaker on WWIE Church Online this Sunday morning. And the title of the message is One Encounter with God Can Seal Loose Lips and Heal Dirty Hearts. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for 2024. God bless you. Thank you. And Happy yeah. New Year, everybody. Now, what I want to start out with, because I kind of tell stories, I want to paint a scenario and then we're going to read Isaiah chapter 6. But I want to paint a scenario before we do that. And I want to, I want you guys to kind of uh, humor me on this. Go with me into the king's castle. You're moving into the king's castle. You're being invited in, escorted in. You're going into a, a, a procession, going down the, the pathway until you're on both sides so that, you, you know, then you're waiting for the king to enter. But here's what happens. When you get into the king's presence, you bathe, you put on your best cologne, you make sure your deodorant, your clothes, you took it to the cleaners, you're wearing your best attire. You're standing in your best posture possible. You may be angry at your wife, you may be angry at your kids, you may be angry at your husband, but the king will not see that. Now we're talking a human king. But this is royalty, and you have to put your best foot forward. So no matter what your attitude is, you got to stand there with a royal smile on your face. Now, here the king is coming in, and now you're starting to interact a little bit after he's gotten his honors and his, you know, whatever. Now, what I notice is when people are in the presence of royalty, of high-level politicians, of, of so-called important folk, nobody's cussing. You notice that? Nobody's cussing. Oh, no, no, no. You're not going to hear the S-H word. You're not going to hear the F-U word. You're not going to hear any of the little four or five letter things that we slip around talking you know, when we're in a casual setting. You're not going to hear those words just like we don't hear those words when we are in church service. Here's the sad part, y'all. When yeah. we get around our homies, our friends, our, hang our running buddies, whether they're saved or not, we relax, we take our shoes off, we kick back, we take our little Christian costume off, and the words come flying in any direction we choose because we grown. We three times seven. What does that mean? I'm 21. I'm grown. You can't tell me how to talk. No, I can't tell you, and you can't tell me, but God does. Let's go to Isaiah. I just want to paint that scenario. There are things that we say we can't control, but when we are in the setting, the control is there. Let's go to, and one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is called what? Self-control. And that's one of those things we tend to leave in the back drawer when we leave the house. All right, let's go to Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face, and with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. That's the glory of God. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. 
for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let me stop there one minute before we go any further. I'm going to read six, but just give me a second. Do you notice that the first thing that happened was someone had to die before he saw the Lord? There are some things in us that have to die before we see the Lord. And there are many mm. born again Christians who have never seen the Lord because they refuse to die. Moving right along, I'll let the Holy Spirit work on you with that one. But for some folks that have not experienced God, it's because they will not allow some things to die. All right. Now we go to five. Then said I, woe is me. Why did he say woe is me? Because when you have darkness and you shed light, it is a stark difference. When God's presence comes in, when you experience God, when you come into his presence, conviction comes. You see yourself. The light is on you, baby. And if you're in the right spirit, you're going to be bothered by what you see. Yes, have, yes. have you ever held a clean diamond and a dirty diamond next to each other or a cloudy diamond next to an almost perfect diamond and you move them around in the same light source the the dazzling the clear flawless diamond is the lights gonna dance and sparkle and and oh my god it's a beautiful sight with all the facets but a a diamond that has a cloud in it. It can't even sparkle. Why? Because there's too much, there's, there's too much clutter in it. It can't reflect that the brilliance of the light. It just sits there looking like a piece of junk that somebody bought at the five and dime store. My question, what do people see when they see you are you clear as crystal or is your spirit clouded with anger is your spirit clouded with bitterness is your spirit clouded with hatred with resentment with memories that you won't let die you know let me share this quick story there are times when we think we're walking with the Lord pretty good. We're in step. We're in rhythm. We're dressed. I got rhythm. I mean, we got it going on from head to toe. We got our favorite hats on. We got our favorite wigs or weaves or whatever we do. <laughs> and we're stepping high. But the Bible always says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. And one of my friends told me, I want to stay on point, so Lord help me. One of my friends told me years ago, when she was praying about one of her church members, she was beside herself saying, well, Lord, I do this and I do, well, why can't they? I mean, if I can do it, why? It doesn't make sense. It don't look like they really mean it because blah, blah, blah. And I, I do this and I do that. And I mean, I don't, it's, it's. I mean, I love you enough to do it. Why can't they? And blah, 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 blah. And the Lord spoke audibly to her. For those of you who might struggle with that end, who made you the standard? That stops us mm. from judging. All right. And that stops mm. us from being so intolerant. Because like I said in that other message, when you're sniffing up on them, God is sniffing up on you. When you're smelling their stink, God smells your stench. Mm, all right. So here we are. Years ago, I have to tell this story because part of what clouds our spirit 
and hinders us from reflecting the brilliance, the dazzle of the glory, the light, the love of the holiness of God is bitterness. Years ago, when I was unsaved, I basked in bitterness. I had a long list of folks I would never forgive. I would never let them off the hook. As far as I'm concerned, mm. if they die today or tomorrow, I'd go dance on their grave and throw a party. That's the way I felt. Honestly. All right. One was a family mm. member who molested me when I was 15. My mother begged me not to tell my father. <laughs> she knew he would kill him. <laughs> Another one was a man, uh, was, uh, well, let's say three different men, three different times when I was raped, date raped. Another time when I was dating a guy who slapped me. And I was like, oh, no, baby, no, 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 no. No man puts his hand on me. It's over. As far as I'm concerned, you are dead. And I just got out the truck and found my way home. That was the last time I ever spoke to that man. And I hung out at the same nightclub. Remember, I was unsaved. Now, when God saved me at 27, I'm telling you the story to show you what I mean. When God saved me at 27, <clears throat> I sat and had a long talk with him when I got home. And I said, I don't want to be one of them Christians that are only saved when I'm in church. I don't want to be one of them Christians that are only nice when I'm in a good mood. Hmm. I don't want to be one of them Christians that tell people off, blow them up in public, disrespect them, talk about them behind their back, and say whatever I'm big and bad enough to say, like a chick cussed me out, and she was, she was, she was known as being a born-again Christian, but she cussed me out better than everybody in my family could cuss, and we were some cussing sailors in my family. And I looked at her like, where's the Jesus in that? Ah, that's one of the things that made me not want to be a Christian. Loose-lipped Christians that can't control their temper and they can't control their tongue. Why? Because it's in their heart. There's too much clouds, too much clutter, too much, uh, 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 I forget the term they use for diamonds. Infute, no, it's not the word, but it's too much mess up in there that they won't deal with. I mean, if you're constipated, you'll go to the store and buy a laxative. If you're spiritually constipated, why are you not going to God to get help? Okay. So, here we are. I'm sitting here now. This is the time I'm unsaved. I get slapped by this guy. And I got out the truck. Now, he knew because we hung out at the same club for years. He knew I never spoke to him. I never looked at him. If I saw him come in the room, I'd make sure I was obviously looking the other way. I wanted him to know. I wanted him to feel my wrath. Listen to this. Listen, listen. I wanted him to feel my wrath. I wanted him to never forget. You put your hands on me, sucker. You are never going to do that again. You're never going to get the honor of me even speaking to you because you ain't worthy. I want you to know. I don't ever want you to think I'm forgetting what you did to me. That's the bitterness. Now mm -hmm. check it out. Yeah. So years later, I get saved. Now he's known me to ignore him all those years. I get saved, and my friend and I go to the uh, to Target, and lo and behold, see, God will do this. He'll have you cross the path of the person that you are bothered by or that bothers you, whatever the case is. So here, I ask the Lord to help me forgive everybody on that long list I had. I wrote their names. I wrote the acts of the people that I didn't know their names, but I asked God to help me forgive everyone and help me to be a forgiving, 
born again Christian so that anytime mm. I need mercy, I will get it because mm. that will obligate mm. you, Lord, to give me mercy. Why? Because I read in the word to the merciful. I will show myself merciful. And Jesus said out of his own mouth, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain or they will get mercy if they give it. That's another way of saying that. All right. Yes. So what happens is I'm walking up to the store with my friend and the security guard ends up being the guy who slapped me. <laughs> listen, listen. I'm trying to make the word as practical as possible. So I hope you really get it. So um, I go to the store and I say to the guy, uh, <laughs> how you doing so-and-so? Now here's the thing. I didn't hesitate. I just realized, oh, that's him. Because I speak to people if our eyes meet. And he didn't see me. And I said, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? And he looked up and he did a double take. He was like, what? She's talking to me? <laughs> and I said, how you doing? Now, let me tell you how I felt inside. I had joy, mm -hmm. the resentment, the yeah. anger from all that that I, I swam in was gone. Yes. It was gone. Yes. It's like, mm -hmm. Lord, how do you do that? Because one of the things I asked when I said, Lord, if it's that important for you to, ha to have me do the forgiving, I don't have the ability. Let me tell you how honest I was before we continue with that story. I don't have the ability to forgive, Lord. I'm talking to the Lord now. This is before this encounter. I don't have the ability and I don't want to. That was my honest feeling to God. But since your yeah. word says, if I don't forgive them, you won't forgive me. That obligates me yeah. whether I want to or not. So this is what I'm asking you to do for me. Would you please give me the ability? Because I don't have it. Number two, would you also please remove the bitterness, remove the resentment, remove the anger, and all three I rebuke and cast out of me in the name of Jesus. There you go. I was trying to mortify the deeds of the flesh so those three elements would die because I was I was begging to experience God and I was trying to remove every piece of trash out of my spirit out of my thought life out of my emotions out of my desires Lord please manifest yourself to me so here we now we're back at the store and the guy did the double take. And when he looked, I'm smiling. And he's like, hi, Pat, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing fine. How you been doing? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> he was befuddled. He was dumbfounded. He was stunned. He was speechless. <laughs> it was funny. And it felt so free inside of my heart, y'all. The most beautiful That's thing true. when God does it in you. So he says, he asked me, he says, where you been? I said, oh, oh yeah, you haven't seen me for a long time. I gave my heart to the Lord. That was my witness. Well, now, I didn't preach to him. Jesus. I didn't tell him, now nah, boy, if you don't get your act straight, you going to hell. I didn't go that route. I didn't go that route. Oh, I yeah. wanted him to see the miracle of forgiveness. I wanted him to see the love of God in me. That's what I wanted him to see. Because it ain't my job to convince anybody into or out of hell. It's my job to be a reflection. To have the multifaceted reflection of God's love, God's light, without all the clouds in the diamond. I want to be a clear, flawless diamond. And I know I'll never be flawless because we all fall short of the glory of God. But I'm going to try my best. Thank you. Now, so here he is shocked. This isn't the end of the story. Years later. 
that man Amen. and his wife walk in to the same church that I attend after my husband Milton and I have gotten married. The reason he knows both yes. of us is because we all hung out at the same nightclub. So he sees Milton, who he hasn't seen for almost a decade. He sees me, who he hasn't seen except for that one encounter at the store in the middle of that decade. And he's like, whoa, you guys are married? He's like, yes. And what happened? We go out and eat together. My husband and I go out and eat with him and his wife. We're fellowshipping. We're having a love feast, y'all. And I'm saying, look Praise at God. God. Look at God. Reconciliation to the max. Now, here's a second one that I'm going to cut it short. I'm going to go back to the scripture. I'm not done reading it, believe it or not. The second story I want you to hear is a relative that molested me when I was 15. As far as I was concerned, that was another one that was dead. I was waiting for him to die so I could celebrate on top of his grave. I was that angry. I was that bitter. And when he came in the house, I went the other way. When he came to visit my mother and father, I went the other way. I was, I, I was in the wind. I didn't want to speak to him, didn't want to look at him, because my mother made me keep his secret. You know how women do. They hide all the stuff. You know, they always want to keep the peace. So they know. <laughs> but anyway... So what ended up happening was after, let me see, I was 27, after 12 years of that bitterness, right? That man comes to the door. Now, I had already prayed that prayer with the Lord. Take the anger out. Help me forgive. I can. I don't want to, but help me. He comes to the door about three months after I get saved. He walks in. He says, uh, hi, I just want to, uh, to visit Buddy. I open the door. I mean, I open the door and that's what he says. And the smile is it's involuntary, y'all. Big old fat smile is on my face. I'm like, what the heck? And I said, Pop's in there. And I'm inside, I'm tripping like, Lord, Lord, what's this? What's going on? So he goes to sit and talk with my father while I dash into my bedroom. And I said, Lord, Lord, what, 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 where's the anger? Where's the lump? Where's the knot? It's gone. I was shocked. So I'm taking my time with this to show you in detail how thoroughly God not only saves, God not only fills you with his Holy Spirit, God not only cleanses and purges, but he changes you on the inside. See, a lot of people think repentance is, I'm sorry, Lord, please forgive me. No, baby, that's putting your hand on a doorknob. You got to open that door and walk through it and do the acts of repentance. Because repentance means change, about face. You're heading east, turn around, head west. Wrong way, you're getting ready to turn on a on a side street that says wrong way. You know you got to stop and pass that street up because you're not to turn in there. But if you're going down Colorado Boulevard and you're heading west and you know that Pasadena City College is east, you know you're going the wrong way, just like you do when you're committing sin while walking with the Lord. So you got to stop at the yeah. next light with that allows you to make a U-turn and head the other way. Because if you don't head the yeah. other way, you'll never see Pasadena City College, let alone get there. My question to you is, uh, do you want to see God? Or do you want to keep hitting and missing? Do you want to keep hearing about everybody else talking about how I saw the Lord high and lifted up? And you clap and say, praise the Lord, glory to God. But it never happens for you because you're not willing to let things die. You're not willing to forgive. You're not willing to let bygones be bygones. You're not willing to reconcile and be nice to the people who were mean to you. See, this is what I found. Do you know neither one of those guys ever apologized to me? Neither one of them. 
But let me tell you, when your forgiveness is full-fledged, when your forgiveness is to the max, they never have to, to apologize. It never has to come up. You don't even have to broach the subject. Why? Because forgiveness is total. It's without mm -hmm. strings attached. Forgiveness, God's way, is the same as unmerited favor. They, they may not deserve to be forgiven, baby. But your heart, because you went to God for the ability, your heart is able to look them in the face, give them a hug. Okay, Lord, okay, I got to tell that too. Please be patient with me, you guys. I'm breaking it down. My heart has been burdened seeing so many saints carrying garbage that they've angered and spite that they've carried for 30, 40 years talking about they love the Lord, but they hate so-and-so that did that to them. Oh, I'm in my salon and I'm cleaning up, getting ready to, to leave. I make sure it's clean so the next day I can come in and everything's ready to roll. And I get a knock on the door, and it's from a woman. This woman, I allowed, because we went to high school together, to rent my house, my two-bedroom house, for only $500 a month, trying to make it easy on her. She spent the last seven months complaining about, uh, uh, well, I had to pay the plumber, so I don't owe you any rent. The plumber cost $200. What about the other $300? So, as time went on, I got no rent, and this is what, this is what got it going. Because my husband fell down the flight of stairs, and he was 100% blind even when we started dating, because he lost his eyesight. Um, anyway. So he lost his eyesight for diabetes, glaucoma, all that, while we were attending church. You know, we all knew each other. He was sighted, he drove and all that, but he lost his eyesight. So when we started dating, he was blind and he was able to handle the stairs. We got married. He was able to handle the stairs going up and down, no problem. But one day his son left the door open and he fell down the flight of stairs thinking he was going into the dining room. He got turned around because he wasn't using his cane. He was, had his hands out in the air, and I'm in the bedroom. God has me quoting, no weapon formed against Milton will prosper. And I'm wondering, why am I led to say that? So I kept saying it over and over in the name of Jesus, and then I hear, blang a lang a lang he's down the stairs. So I asked the lady, after he goes, you know, we go through the healing process and all that, and the x-rays, I asked the lady, I said, I need to, uh, to move Milton back in this house because he needs to be on a one-story he needs to be at the bottom level now. He doesn't need to deal with the stairs. So I sent her a, a letter, you know, saying that. And that's when the rent stopped. That's when the rent stopped. She didn't pay me for seven months, y'all. In my house. Mm. She didn't pay me for seven mm. months. So she takes me to court. <laughs> it was crazy, y'all. And my pastor told me, don't fight it, yield to it, and just get her out. Don't fight it. Don't worry about your rights. Don't worry about the money she owes you. Just get her out. That's your goal. Get her out so you can get Milton in. That's the goal. So I followed her instructions, even though I totally disagreed with her. But I took godly counsel, and I swallowed my pride, and I said, Lord, if this is your will, help me do it the way she says it. And this woman, we went through this little court nonsense, and then she finally got out. And when she got out, she was not there. She was not ordered by the court to pay me the back rent. I was angry about that. But I had to ask the Lord, take the anger out. Help me forgive. Now we're back at the salon. This is about two years later. I'm at the salon, and then knock, knock, knock on my window. And it's her. And she's drunk as a scum. And I'm wondering, what does she want? And I open the door and she says, I just want a hug. How you doing? And I, I felt in my heart, 
I said, Lord, thank you. I don't feel the resentment. I don't feel the anger. And I hugged her. And I said, Lord, in my heart, I was saying, Lord, let her feel your love. Let her feel the comfort that only you can give. Save her soul. She didn't have anything to talk about. She wanted a hug. And I was get, just getting ready to explain, uh, you know, about that house thing. She said, don't worry about it. I understand. And she went on and left. And that was the end of that. See, what I'm trying to get you to understand, no enemy has to remain an enemy. Some of your enemies that you have today, if you do everything God's way, can become your greatest ally down the road somewhere. They may fight against you today, but 10 years from now, they may be the only ones that get that door open for you because they saw how you handled what they know was nasty treatment to you, undeserved ugliness. And they will be your ally because you handled it God's way, and they know it. Yes, yes, They yes, know it. Yes. Now, let's go on and finish reading this. I'm almost done, y'all. I'm not going to take up much time. Okay, but, but the Lord was just leading me to slow down on that. All right. Yes. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. How many of you, don't answer, please don't. How many of you know that you know that you know? You're not just believing, but you know that you know that you know. Number one, God loves you. You know that you know that you know God is real. Why? Because he showed up in your life when nobody was around but you. One-on-one -on -one encounter. How many of you have had that experience? Yeah. See, this is what I want to say. This is what motivates you to live clean. This is what motivates holiness and righteousness is when you are, okay, let's put it in human terms. Let's break it down. You ladies, you men, when you find that special somebody, and you want to swoon, you, you want to woo them, and and oh, and I mean, just just shower them with great impressions. You dress nice. You wear your nice cologne. You put on, you know, you get your hair cut. You get your hair styled. You, I mean, you you put your best foot forward. You take them out. You wine them, dine them. You do whatever. You take them to the amusement park. Take them to the beach. You take them to all these nice places and. You sit and you talk under the moonlight. You do all this little fancy stuff. <clears throat> Take them in your best yeah. car, not your raggedy car. You know how we do. But here's the thing. When the relationship starts to get common, think about this. When the relationship starts to get common, you kind of let down some of your, you, you know, you kind of take off some of those masks. And you start being the real you. And before you know it, one day, the two of you are in a blown up argument. And you're like, whoa, this is ugly, y'all. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, what are we arguing about? This is stupid. But neither one of you, for some reason, neither one of you can shut your mouth. The blah, 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 mm. blah, 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 blah. Well, you, blah, 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 and you, blah, 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 blah. And well, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, you just drop dead. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you just go to hell. As far as I'm concerned, you can jump and play off the freeway. It just gets uglier. But next thing you know, the cuss words are coming like the bullet from a Gatling gun. Bam, 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 bam. Ain't no mm. Jesus anywhere in it. Because ain't no Jesus anywhere in your heart at that moment. You are lost in the sauce. Yeah. You're all caught up in your anger. You're all caught up in your rage. Just like a person with diarrhea. They can't control it. It hits wherever you are. It comes out and you're embarrassed because everybody knows it. Here's the sad 
point where the person with diarrhea, they're embarrassed. They don't want people seeing them that way. But when you act the fool, oh, you're proud of it. Oh, I told them this. <laughs> yeah, buddy, I said yeah. this, I said that. They heard every word of it too, baby. <laughs> yeah, I told them all. I gave them an earful, honey. Mm -hmm. They ain't going to forget what I said. Yeah, but God ain't either. Right. <laughs> God was there in your conversation because he was in your midst, smelling the stench. And your that kind of behavior stinks worse to God than a person going down the street with diarrhea. Trust me on that. Yeah. We may not like that smell, but God hates what's coming out of you. Yes. All right, moving right along. Okay, seven. And he laid it upon my mouth. I'm sorry, six. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Mm. Now, before we mm. get to number eight, check it out. <laughs> How many of you have obeyed God to the point of tears? You know, see, like right now, today, this is what, 2024, I got saved in September 6, 1981, Sunday night, I mean, Sunday morning. Now, let me tell you this, y'all. I still know how to cuss. I can cuss like a sailor. But I can honestly say that if I go back 10 years, I might have slipped four or five times in the whole 10 years or in the whole five, whatever. It's not, an, it's not a, I'm not saying I never ever do wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm the standard. Definitely not the standard. The point is, when you have experienced, oh, Lord. Okay, when do I address that? I'll touch my lips. Okay. All right. When you have experienced God, when there is a love that flows back and forth from you to him, him to you, there's some things you can't allow yourself to do. It's not because you don't want to go to hell. It's because of your respect, your high honor for God and all he's done for you all he, on a daily basis throughout the day. All the times he reminds you, put gas in your tank. He reminds you, look back and you see your wallet sitting on the table. And you know God's literally babysitting you. He's carrying you. He's walking you through the day, trying to help you have as few mishaps as possible. He, when, that's what the Bible means when it says he's, he's ahead of us, making the crooked places straight and the rough places plain, and he's behind us being our rear guard. That means he's got your back, baby. He's covering you mm. on all sides. So what happens? What happens when you experience God to the point where you're closer to God than you are to anybody else on the planet? God is the one who you choose to please. God is the one who you're concerned about. What is his assessment of me? Lord, don't let there be any wicked way in my heart. Lord, tell me, don't let me go a minute with crap in my heart. Don't let me go a minute with poison. That stuff that happened 20 or 30 years ago, Bury it, Lord. Help me kill it so you can bury it and gouge it out of my spirit at the root because I don't want that stuff poisoning me. It's not about, Lord, I don't want a booty whooping and I don't want to go to hell. No. It's, Lord, I love you. Look what you've done for me. I'm so grateful to you. I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want you being sorry that you accepted me into the fold. 
I don't want to crucify you afresh with my loose lips and my filthy heart. I don't want to embarrass you with my foul attitude. You don't deserve that from me. So what do we want to do? We want to experience verse 8. Also I heard the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Then he said, Go. Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, see ye indeed. So he sends him. We're not going to deal with the rest of that right now. We're just dealing with, with the individual. He sends him. Can God send you to do anything? Or if, or if he's, not, check it out. If he sends you on Tuesday and things go well and everything is praise the Lord, glory to God, I bless and praise your holy name. And you run across some sucker or you run across some, some hard situation in the day that frustrates the pants off of you. Or you're going to be sitting up there ready to cuss the next booger out because they got in your way at the wrong time. They just caught me at the wrong time. I'm sorry. No, I'm human. God just got to understand. No, baby. God already understands. He doesn't have to understand the way you want him to. He does understand, though. He understands more than you know. He understands why you have diarrhea of the mouth. He understands why your heart is so full of toxins. He understands why you have such a short fuse. See, one thing I always know, if my car is running down the street and I hear tick, 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 I know my car is low on oil. Listen to what I'm saying, y'all. Low on oil. The oil comes from the anointing of being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you are getting irritated easily, if you are getting easily annoyed, if people get on your nerves, if that one rubs you the wrong way and that one won't do it your way, and why won't they listen to me? And why won't they handle things I'm trying to tell them what to do? Guess what? That means your love tank is low. And you need to go to the source, to the gas station. Ask God, Lord, fill me up because my love is low. When your love is low, you can't tolerate the imperfections of other people. They drive you up the wall. But when your love is full, you don't see the problem as much as you see the need. What does God, what does the Bible say about God? God sees the needs. He sees the needs of the heart, the needs of the soul. He understands why things are the way they are. But he doesn't want to leave you that way. Okay. So if we want to go forward, if we want to move up, what do we have to do, y'all? We have to shed the dead weight. Right? We have to, we have to get rid of those weights and the sins that so easily beset us and run with patience. So, uh, last story, and I, I believe I'm done, right, Lord? I don't want to. I don't want this to be no hour-long sermon. Okay. Last story that's coming to my mind. If it comes to my mind, I'm gonna share it. Sorry, y'all. I'm trying to follow the Holy Spirit. This guy I knew, taxi driver. I went to watch one of his plays at a church. I watched him act and I said, oh my God, because I majored in acting. I said, oh my God, this man is a marvel. He's one of those that could get an Oscar or a, a Grammy. He's at the level of Sean Connery. He's at the level of Denzel Washington. He's at the level of uh, James Earl Jones. I mean, he's a heavyweight, heavyweight actor driving a taxi cab. And I wonder why. And the more I spent time with him, because I knew God had assigned me to him, to witness to him. He already told me, unclean, don't even mess with that one. That's off limits. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll just be a witness. 
And that's what I was with him the whole time. But let me tell you, God showed me why he never made it to the Grammys. You know what shortchanged him? Him. His attitude. He would tell people off in the New York Minute. Somebody would get on his nerves and he'd, 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 quote, he'd spit it out. He'd spit it out. He's big and bad enough to say what he wants to say. He's going to say it. Don't tell me what I ain't going to say. And he cheated himself out of a master career because of his foul mouth. He would not use self-control. Remember I started with being in the castle and the king is there? Ain't nobody going to cuss in his presence. Ain't nobody going to sit up there and, and, and dress like a fool in the king's presence. No, they be put out that castle in the New York Minute. Yet, we're in God's presence 24-7. Why can't we live our lives from second to second, from thought to thought, from minute to minute, from word to word, from hour to hour, from act to act? Why can we not put forth every effort to give God our best behavior all day long? Even when we're alone, something fall on the floor and we get mad because it broke. Is God going to hear a cuss word or are you just going to say, I've, I've done this. Ah, Lord, help me, help me. Oh, that gets on my nerves. But I bite my lip not to cuss. How much effort are you putting forth? Because see, the more effort you put forth in living a life for him, whether you're alone where nobody can hear you but God, or whether you're out in public, or here's the other thing, <laughs> what you feel about people, what you think about people, what you say about people behind their back. My question to you is how high do you want to go? Because baby, if you don't shed this, those dead weights, if you don't get rid of those weights that so easily beset you, just like a helium balloon that's flying high because it's filled with helium, you start tying stuff to it and it's going to slow it down till it hovers. You keep tying stuff to it and it's going to start sinking lower and lower and lower but if you cut that string and get rid of all that weight that balloon's gonna woo, go straight up high as possible are you gonna cut your strings to your past are you gonna cut your strings to the anger the bitterness that you have every right to feel but it's not godly it's not going to be part of your destiny and it will cheat you out of it as well do you want that to happen or do you want to live to the fullest? Is it worth sacrificing to God? And I'm going to end with this scripture and I'm done. I promise. Romans chapter one. I mean, sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, I believe. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And my question is, how do you renew your mind? By the word of God. Let it wash you, baby. I'm done. God bless you. Go forward and move up. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's give them a hand. Hallelujah. What a dynamic, powerful, Amen. powerful message. My God, my God. Hallelujah. You should have got something out of that somewhere. And maybe we my need it. Every hallelujah. And say it because I'm thinking the church is getting carnal and messy. Hallelujah. <laughs> 